Okay. Well, welcome to the webinar on uh, experiences with user interface platforms related to climate data, organized by Climate Europe. Uh, my name is Jeanette Besseminder from the Dutch KNMI, and together with my colleague Rob Groenland, I will host this webinar. Um, we're both working for the Climate Europe project, and um, well, we organized this, uh, this webinar. Well, first of all, why this webinar? Um, well, interaction with users has become very important for the development of climate services and for the dissemination of results of many projects on climate change and climate adaptation. Besides face-to-face -face meetings, there is also a lot of attention for user interface platforms, or uh, UIPs. However, almost all projects develop their own website for this. Uh, during the webinar, two speakers will tell what was the idea behind their setup of their uh, website and what are their experiences. After the presentation, we will discuss what we can learn from the experiences from these projects and maybe from your own uh, experiences. Um, the first speaker is Juan Jose Sainz de la Torre. He works as a science communicator uh, at Predixia, Intelligent Data Solutions. There's someone with a microphone open. Can you please mute your phone? Okay. Um, for the Primavera project, uh, Predixia developed a, um, a user interface platform. Um, and Primavera is a project on high resolution climate data modeling. Um, Juan will present the, the, the results of it, but his colleague Gar Markel Garcia uh, did a lot on the design and the implementation of the user intelligent platform. Juanjo, can I give you the floor? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you want me to present now? Yes, please. Moment, I, yeah, I muted all, but uh, you can unmute again. Okay, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I will share my screen so you can see it. Yes. And now you can see it. So, yeah. yeah. It's there, and now on okay. the full screen, please. Yes. So thank you, Janet and Rob, for giving me the opportunity to present the Primavera platform here, and for giving us the floor to discuss more about uh, this type of user interface platforms and what they bring uh, to the users and how to do it. As you said, uh, the platform was developed within the Primavera project and also with me here today in the audience is Markel Garcia Diez. He has a, a more technical profile. He's a climate and weather scientist and he was involved in mainly in the development on, uh, on this user interface platform. So to give you a brief overview first of the of this webinar, I want to go into a little bit of the details of the Primavera project so you can understand what the project is about and the results that were produced. And then talk a little bit more about why is such an user interface platform necessary. And then I will go into a little bit more of detail on the Primavera user interface platform and the intentions that uh, were be, uh, behind this, this platform. So, in short, uh, the Primavera project wants uh, to develop um, climate models with a higher uh, resolution, both spatial and, and temporal resolution. And if we were to summarize the, the project in one image, it would be uh, this one, to go from a, a grain uh, image to go into a much more finer image of the models uh, around the Earth's climate. It is an H2020 project, uh, and uh, the H2020 project involves 19 partners with almost 15 uh, million euros uh, of budget that have been working for the last uh, 4.5 years. The results are quite big. It's 1.8 petabytes of data that they have produced across seven, seven different uh, climate models. 
the objective is to develop this new generation of global climate models that are capable of simulating and predicting the regional climate with unprecedented fidelity and with a much more higher temporal and spatial resolution. Uh, the objective of this is to take into account different uh, stakeholders, mainly governments, businesses, and also society in general. Because a lot of uh, initiatives, that, initiatives that have to do with uh, climate adaptation and climate mitigation have agendas that run up to 2050. So the models that uh, Primavera has been running and has developed run from the 1950s to uh, up to the 2050. The reason for behind this is that uh, you need some years to compare with pa the past climate and therefore the projects run from the 1950s up until the present to be able to make these uh, comparisons and then the models take up until 2050 to inform the societal challenges that uh, are in need of new climate data and especially in data that uh, have a much more higher uh, climate uh, resolution uh, both spatially and temporally. As I said, the stakeholders that uh, mainly need this data are governments, businesses and the society in general. And uh, the Primavera project was a first step towards these models. The data are still being validated and they are uh, the first results are quite good and the first uh, validation uh, tests are coming in quite good. And uh, the Primavera was a test for the viability and also to see the added value of these, uh, of these models. So in the uh, context of Primavera, which has a project website, we develop uh, Predixia and other partners of the, of the Primavera Consortium. We develop a user interface platform. But before going into detail into the, into the user interface platform, I want to take a minute uh, to summarize or to answer the question, why do we need a user interface platform in the first place? And I will give you a, a little analogy with a, with a watch or a clock. The first thing that you need to, that we need to have clear uh, when talking about user interface platforms is that when we are designing tools that are intended for a specific user, in this case, uh, different uh, sectors in the economy, we have to take or keep in mind the needs that these users have, because otherwise we will end up with the tool that you with a slide that you see in the GIF, where the users, in this case the kids, are not using the slides at all and they are using the tool that we have designed in a very different way that we intended to. So if we don't keep the users in mind when presenting the climate data and uh, climate results, maybe we don't we end up with results that are quite good, but we are not reaching the users in a right way and they end up not using uh, the results that we have been uh, working on. And I want to speak uh, about this using a little analogy about the clock, because uh, we are all uh, used to measure the time with our watches. We wear it on our wrists every time and they are quite useful to us. But we are users of the, of the watch, of the clock, and we don't usually differentiate it a lot among watches and clock. Uh, for us, the watch is something that just uh, tells us the time. But if we were to ask a watchmaker, they have a very different view. They see the insights of a watch and they are preoccupied and they are, uh, their everyday today activity is focused on making the watch function. And when they look into a watch, they see the little details and the insights. They see the turbulence, they see the little uh, granaries inside working, and they are worried about the little details on the watch, making that watch to work smoothly so users can uh, tell the time. In the case of climate data and climate services, sometimes the case is that uh, if you work as a climate scientist, 
you are very worried about the consistency of the model, about uh, the uh, that the model uh, gives the data in an appropriate way, and also that the model uh, has as little uh, errors as possible and to give a, a model that works right. But in that process, it's easy to forget that uh, the climate data has to be made available to people that need that climate information. That they are worried to get the time and they are not as worried uh, as in the detail details of the model. So, for the climate services market, we have the case that we need to show the same results of the project, the higher resolution and uh, special uh, models, to many different users. And if we keep on going with the clock analogy, with the watch analogy, we will see that there are many different types of watches. And what relates this uh, with uh, climate information services is that sometimes uh, we need one unique clock to show one climate model or one climate index uh, is of interest to the user, but maybe there are users that need to compare different clocks and to know different times uh, across the earth. So for climate services, uh, some users need to be able to compare maybe uh, future and past projections or to compare different uh, climate indexes or compare different climate models between them. If we want to reach a general audience, the society in general, a big clock is uh, maybe the best option because we need uh, to put a big clock in the top of a tower so everyone knows the time more or less. They do not need maybe as much detail as a, as a specialist uh, would need in the case of climate, sci uh, of climate scientists, but uh, they need to guess whether the time is right or not. They, if you go and look to a clock in the street, you do not need to know whether it's uh, one o'clock and zero four as much as it's nearly uh, one o'clock and you are late uh, for work. In the case of climate data, an example for this uh, would be, for example, conscientization campaigns that are vigilant upon the needs of the Paris Climate Agreement, for example, and whether we are, uh, if we are meeting those agreements or not. But there are, on the other hand, climate users that need very specific details. In that case, the, equi the equivalent on watch uh, would be this stopwatch to people who are running that need a very fine detail on the time they are making. In the case of Primavera, as I, as I said, there were multiple stakeholders engaged uh, uh, for the climate data of Primavera. In our case, we targeted the, the data sets and the results for six specific uh, financial sectors and the society in general, because uh, how you talk and the takeaway messages that you present to these stakeholders have to be very different in order to be useful for them and also to engage and get their attention. In the case of Primavera, uh, it was the agriculture sector, also the renewable energies uh, sector, the financial, the health and the transport sector, as well as the water management uh, sectors. These were the key sectors that Primavera wanted to engage through its user interface platform. And also we wanted to leave some information for the general public, for the broad audience and society in general. So, how did we do that? Uh, it involved many, many people, not only us at Predixia uh, with Markel, but also a previous step uh, was needed because to not end up with the slide that I showed in the slide before, with the children using not the slide at all, 
we wanted to engage the users directly. We wanted to get in touch with the people in those financial sectors directly. For this, uh, we were lucky enough to be inside a big consortia and count with the contribution of the experience of the Met Office, the KNMI and the Barcelona Supercomputer User Engagement Team. And those teams were able uh, to provide an initial survey that was distributed among many different actors of the different sectors. And in total, we gathered 83 responses across 12 uh, European countries. The main takeaway from this survey is that you need the information in advance. And to do this, to be able to provide a survey that it's useful and provides you useful information, there are two key messages. The one is the first one is that you make the survey in a way that it's plain and clear. You have to measure the language that you are using in the survey. And you have to target it and keep in mind that the audiences that you are reaching are not climate scientists. And also there is a problem with accessibility with multiple languages that uh, you need to make the survey more accessible without uh, the barrier language. As Gloria says in, uh, in Modern Family, a TV series, uh, you know how much, uh, how intelligent that sounds in Spanish in a language that it's not mine because the users that you are going to reach are across the world and if you uh, uh, if you keep out this language barrier you are able to get a more nuanced information and get more into the details after doing this initial survey we end up uh, developing the content for the user interface platform that I will show you uh, now. But the key content is a data viewer, which is an interactive visualization of some of the project results. There are also uh, sector pages with uh, key information for each of the sectors in a separate way. There are also some sectors fact sheets, which are specific cases for the different sectors, and also some climate fact sheets that uh, are some factoids uh, about uh, climate and climate modeling that are intended for the general audience. And also, this is very important, uh, across all the materials, it was intended to use uh, storytelling. We have developed some story maps, we have some specific cases that relate uh, the models uh, generated by Primavera with some specific uh, climate phenomena, like the extra tropical cyclones. But I want to show them uh, this firsthand. So I will share you the first, the, the data viewer. The data viewer is a material that we develop uh, at Prediction, and it involved uh, several, it has several challenges. The first one is to filter the information for the user because we cannot make all the information of Primavera available at hand at the first time. So we had to filter out the results and the, that were interesting for the different stakeholders. The second challenge was that it was, this was a lot of information. It was several terabytes of data that needed uh, to be made available in a way that it's fast and it's engaging for the user. So uh, we developed this data viewer where you can compare, uh, as you can see on the screen, the results that were from a previous uh, model with the results that uh, Primavera is able to offer. So the user can see this for uh, themselves and play around with the results in a way that loads quickly and move swiftly. They are able, for example, uh, to click on a specific pixel on the map and the tool uh, provides them with the information across the previous model and also on the current model and they can see the differences. We were also uh, aware that it was important to let the user know that, for example, this information is not available for uh, 
decision making since it has to for decision making it has to go over a lot of validation to make sure that the data are uh, reliable and accurate enough to to involve decision making the user here is able to select among uh, different variables and so the platform loads quite quickly that was uh, quite a challenge and also they are able to select among different uh, seasonal periods or compare data for the whole year and also they are able to see the future projections of the of the model and also they are able to see a compare among absolute values and relative deltas uh, for the for the different uh, temporal periods they are also able to choose whether they want to see the the borders across the countries and select different uh, projections so the objective with this uh, was to provide a visual information about uh, the data that uh, Primavera provides. We have also uh, uh, developed information for the different sectors that I will show you now. They are for the sectors of agriculture and the most important thing is that this information is filtered for the specific users and states the added value of the high resolution models. The other information available on the user interface platform at the climate fact sheets, which are intended for a broad audience. So it's some short uh, factoids about uh, the Primavera models, and they are uh, redacted in a clear and engaging way for the, for the general public. And also, uh, we did a little bit of storytelling to reflect information on specific climate events where the user can see a specific example, for example, this uh, post-tropical cyclone Ortensia, and see and interact uh, with data and climate simulations on these uh, specific events. And also see firsthand the added value that the Primavera models are able to provide. So this is a specific example, but uh, to develop this information, it's very important how you present the information. So we wanted to contact uh, with the users directly. So we made a UIP survey and please, if you are attending this webinar, we encourage to go to the uh, Primavera user interface platform and provide us with some feedback because we are still making changes uh, to this uh, platform that you are able to see. It's not a final result. But uh, to end my intervention here, uh, I want to give you just two slides on some uh, general metrics. The results and the metrics that we have is that uh, a user uh, interface platform for a project such as Primavera is really useful because we are able to gather over 2,000 2, visits on a short period of time. And most of the uh, visits comes from the project's website to begin with. So the people are interested in having the information, uh, making, a, making it the information available in a separate user interface. And also the users in average spend over two and a half minutes on the web page and that on internet time it's a lot of uh, time to spend on one website and i want to finalize by going over some do's and don'ts uh, regarding user interface platforms that come from the experience of the primavera team and also with the experience that we have had on primavera on predictia the first is that uh, to engage the users beforehand and know their needs in uh, on the uh, know their details. Also, provide interactive visualization and let users play around with the data. They come with imaginative ways of interpreting uh, interpreting this uh, data, and also with a ways that they can use this data. I cannot uh, stress, the, stress the next point enough, which is turn the data into stories. Uh, also, 
Uh, on a previous webinar uh, made on data visualization, uh, the importance of storytelling was uh, also very highlighted, but you have to connect the data with the specific events that are relatable to the user. Also, test all across the project in the initial phase of development, during the development, and when the user interface platform is ready, test and provide the users uh, with uh, a way to give you feedback. You need to know whether the user is finding your content useful or not. And also some don'ts uh, to put a, a negative approach. Do not assume the user's needs. Talk with them, interview them, spend time talking with your users because you will be surprised the variety of detail that the users ask for and the way that it's most useful for them to get uh, the data. Also, don't despair. It's easy to despair because developing a platform such as the user interf uh, interface for Primavera targets multiple stakeholders and that it's a hard process. And whenever possible, work with more people. Uh, the advantage of the Primavera project is that it's a consortium uh, it's a consortium that it's wide and has people with many, many, many different expertises. And also in a project such as Primavera, there is a lot of uh, data. Don't give all the data at once. Filter the data for the different users. So uh, that's all uh, from my side. I hope that uh, you found this useful. And I want to give the floor back uh, to Janet uh, to talk a little bit more about this if there are any questions. Thank you, Juanjo, uh, for the presentation. Very well in time also. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are a few uh, remarks, but from Roger Street, uh, maybe they are more for the discussion, but uh, maybe it's good to, to look at the first one. And then meanwhile, um, uh, the next speaker can start up his presentation already. Yes. Well, the, yeah. the, uh, the question of Roger Street was uh, consideration of post-project legacy of the user interface platform. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. the user interface platform was intended uh, with that use in mind to be able to provide the results of Primavera after the project has ended and to be able to provide materials that uh, survived the project's uh, life itself. So in that way, uh, it serves also as an engagement tool for those users that have just known about Primavera and want to go a little bit more into detail uh, before maybe contacting uh, the, the consortium to ask more for, for more uh, specific data sets. Mm -hmm. and, and how long will the, uh, the website remain accessible? Uh, I don't have the specific data on that, but I think it's for um, more than one year in uh, in in the long run. But uh, maybe Markel, my colleague, has more information about that. Yes, hello, it's, it's Markel here. Yeah, uh, there is no date, so it's going to be maintained. I mean, I, I won't say indefinitely because who knows <laughs> what will happen in years, some years, but. Uh, for yes, to give you an example, the, the web of Euporius project is still available and it finished a few years ago. So in principle, the, we are willing to maintain it for, for years. Yeah. And now. Mm -hmm. Project comments on it that that it's also related to the potential to update content. I do not know if that's planned. I, I don't think so in general. Uh, in general, uh, in general, no. Uh, so it's difficult to update the content once that the project uh, has finished. So that's why it was important for us to know what the needs of the users were very in advance to make a to make a content that was also uh, time that was not time limited that yeah. was also useful in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think it's a pity that the experience that you have. <laughs> isn't directly used afterwards, well, maybe in a new project, but uh, well, we'll see. There are a few more remarks, uh, but we first go to the next presentation and then we come back to the other uh, uh, remarks and questions. Yes. 
Okay, our second speaker is Hasse Gosen. He is director of the Climate Adaptation Services. And um, this organization developed the Dutch website on spatial adaptation, which gives an overview of a large range of activities and tools for climate adaptation. Uh, for the Dutch um, uh, Dutch society, and one of them is also the Dutch uh, Climate Impact Atlas. Um, Hasse, we'll give the floor to you. Okay, thanks, Jeanette. Um, I assume you can all see my screen and hear me. Yes. Uh, if not, let me know. No, it's, it's clear. <laughs> Okay, great. So thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'll be talking about co-developing user interfaces for climate services, uh, sharing some of our experiences with uh, setting up uh, the website uh, spatialadaptation.com for the Netherlands and the Climate Impact Atlas that Jeanette was already mentioning. Um, let's move to the next slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, so CAS is a, a small not-for-profit organization, uh, which I started some years ago. Um, and what we try to do is to um, make information, climate information, fit for purpose for, uh, uh, say, societal end users. So you could consider us a boundary organization. We sort of operate in between our scientific institutes and the uh, users on the ground. Um, and we're a spin-off organization from the Dutch uh, research program, which ran back in 2007 to 2014, called Knowledge for Climate. Um, yeah, and the... Yeah. So one of the important things that we do is um, uh, we host and update the uh, Dutch uh, national knowledge portal or website on climate change adaptation. Uh, there's an English version of this portal available as well, www.spatialadaptation.com. So you can have a look if you're interested. Um, so that's one of the things we do. And this portal is really uh, dedicated to local adaptation uh, efforts. So we target city uh, planners, city authorities, and the consultancies that uh, support them. Then um, we're also the host of the Climate Impact Atlas for the Netherlands. And this is uh, an initiative that started back in 2008, where we, together with all uh, research um, uh, groups in the Netherlands, we try to collect and uh, centrally disclose relevant information about climate impact. Um, and yeah, I'll be talking about this uh, example in this talk. Now, um, what I wanted to talk about is, uh, first of all, address some challenges that have been reported in climate services literature and stress the importance of, of user interaction. Um, and then I will talk you through how we developed uh, the web portal and the climate atlas and also a use case we did for Heineken and draw some lessons uh, along the way. So if you look at uh, uh, climate services and the recent literature there, then uh, you find that there's a lot of uh, talk about how we struggle to reach the end user. And uh, already back in 2011, WMO stated that uh, we struggle to reach the last mile to the people who need them most. So, um, and, and uh, yeah, to a large part, this is due to a lack of broader understanding of the decision-making environment. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and this makes sense, I think, to me, because um, for, for, for um, climate scientists, it's, uh, it's not their expertise to understand spatial planning, for instance. So there's, it, it's quite logical that there's a gap there. And I think this is where uh, boundary organizations uh, come in and they play an important role to, to overcome this, uh, this gap. Um, Roger Street, and I think he's in the call uh, uh, today, in, in the roadmap towards climate services, he made a quite strong statement that, use, that climate services should be more user-driven and science-informed. Um, and, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of supply drivenness uh, out there and that is not really effective. Uh, then Carlo Bontempo, um, he, he 
put it quite strongly, he said, we are looking at the valley of death. So yeah, there's, there's constant reporting about how we struggle to reach the end users. And um, yeah, and that's why user interfaces are so uh, important. Um, because there's a growing amount of climate data out there, uh, you could even say an exploding amount of climate data. This is a, a graph I took from a publication by Overpack, which shows the, the uh, increase in, in uh, data, climate data out there. Uh, and because of this abundance of climate data, it's difficult to find your way uh, through all this information. And often you find data being offered in different formats that not everyone can easily uh, work with. Um, most of the data portals out there offer generic data, so essential climate variables, so to speak, and those are not always tailored and targeted to the exact needs of the user. And again, that's why I think boundary organizations and intermediaries uh, play a role there uh, to, to tailor all this information into uh, needs on the ground. Now, if you look at um, web portals and user interfaces um, and again at the literature there uh, then we see a lot of reporting about uh, over complexity of user interfaces and um, uh, guidance uh, is minimal so for users it's it's difficult to find your way um, many websites are uh, rather supply driven um, irrelevant in local context often text-heavy presentations, um, and this is an issue we just touched upon in, this, in the discussion. Often you find there is no post-project maintenance. So a website is being developed through a research fund, but when the project is closed down, there is no post-project maintenance and the, uh, the website dies off. Um, and we keep developing these platforms through all these research uh, uh, projects, but we don't seem to really learn about what's going on. We keep reinventing the wheel, as uh, Rob Swart uh, called it. So a good web portal is hard to find. And I think this is because we tend to underestimate the importance of uh, user interaction and co-creation. We seem to think it's like uh, an outreach activity and we throw in uh, a stakeholder workshop somewhere in the project and then we assume we're doing the right thing or we just, as uh, Dilbert's colleague calls it here, we just easily uh, put easy to use to the requirements list. And uh, yeah, I just want to make a strong point here that user interaction um, is, is crucial and should be at the heart of uh, your project. And um, it, sh it, it, it is not just a matter of um, uh, organizing a workshop, but it should be a continuous co-creation uh, process. And to illustrate that, I'll uh, talk you through some uh, or three examples, actually. Um, and uh, doing that, I'll uh, emphasize seven lessons learned. I'm not going to read them out now, but as we um, uh, go through these examples, um, yeah, I will go through them one by one. So the first example I want to talk about is the development of the Climate Impact Atlas. Um, and this initiative, uh, we started it back in 2008 and uh, Jeanette uh, was there, so uh, uh, she knows uh, a lot about what I'm going to say. Um, we started out with a, a user needs assessment and we visited all 12, 12 uh, provinces in the Netherlands, the regional uh, governments, and we asked them, what do you want to know? And they told us, well, we need hotspot maps, identifying risks of drought, heat and flooding. So. We went back to uh, uh, the researchers um, and we asked them, can you produce those uh, maps for us, please? And well, we uh, generated these hotspot maps and we presented them to the, to the regional governments. And um, well, we found they were not really being used. Um, they did raise interest in the underlying mechanisms causing the risk, but the map maps themselves weren't very useful. 
they they triggered understanding of the say the underlying complexity for instance what is drought and we provided a drought risk map but it raised the question what is drought and when in the season and for which crops and what does it mean for our cities for example so we offered the maps to them this raised new questions and, and new interests and new demands and as a result by now we have an a climate impact atlas that contains over 100 map layers ranging from various climate variables uh, local stormwater flooding maps urban heat maps and so forth so the point i want to make is that in our initial needs assessment they asked basically for four hotspot maps but then after years of uh, uh, consultation and co-creation we end up with a, a rather substantial database with over 100 data layers so the user needs over time um, evolved now um, having all these maps um, created new uh, questions and as a result we now have a guideline on how to perform localized climate risk assessments or stress tests as we call them and now all municipalities in uh, the Netherlands have started making their own uh, risk assessments using the climate impact atlas and to offer support we now have a help desk and this web portal and we reach out to over 500 unique users per day so they download the data and we offer uh, support guidelines and a help desk um, and this is really successful and uh, and works really well now by last year we uh, released a climate damage atlas because new questions were emerging uh, about well how uh, what is the economic damage of all the risks that we are uh, reporting uh, so we now have this damage atlas um, that indicates damage cost so the point i want to make here is that we learned that users at the start of a project uh, not always know what they want to know and why and their needs change over time so it's really important to uh, reserve budget and and uh, uh, resources and time to create to create common understanding a common language and and to go through a process of trial and error um, uh, because yeah at the start you don't really know what you want to know now we move on to the next uh, example and this is about uh, climate services for beer production um, uh, Heineken uh, came to us with a question um, what does climate change mean for our uh, sourcing areas of barley an important question because we don't want the world to run out of beer um, <laughs> so um, yeah, we uh, this this was part of the Copernicus Climate Service uh, development, a really interesting uh, uh, development where there's a, a global climate data store and a toolbox available, and you can build all kinds of interesting applications uh, using this service. Um, so we looked at beer uh, beer production uh, for Heineken, and they asked us specifically, we want to have a product that is boardroom proof. We want to be able to uh, uh, to, to sort of give an elevator pitch in the boardroom at Heineken to clearly bring across the message of climate change. So that was our challenge. Um, and uh, we started out using uh, the data store and we produced some graphs for daily pre precipitation in uh, some of their sourcing areas. And we presented it to Heineken and they didn't like it at all. Um, it was too complicated, uh, but this was what they asked us to do. They asked us to, to generate graphs for daily precipitation in their sourcing areas. So uh, take two, we gave it another try. We developed an interface where we gave them the opportunity to select their the, uh, various uh, climate variables, select various sourcing areas, and we drew in a threshold, a critical threshold for each of these uh, indicators. Still, they were not really interested. They, uh, they didn't like it much. So we went back to the drawing table and then we uh, came up with a story map. And uh, Juanjo, I'm glad you emphasized the same point. Um, uh, we realized that we had, we had to develop a story, a visual story that explains um, 
what what is going on in a very specific and, and relevant way to, to Heineken. So we developed an indicator specific for barley, so not um, a generic um, uh, climate variable, but we turned it into a barley specific indicator um, um, optimum temperature days for, for barley. And we plotted the number of days within this um, optimum temperature range. And we could show how in different climatic uh, periods and scenarios, the suitability of the area would change over time. And we also plotted it in a slightly different way. This is about maximum temperatures. Um, and we added a, a temperature threshold, a critical temperature threshold for, uh, for barley. And um, yeah, we could show that throughout a large part of the growing season, in future climate, um, the climate will simply become too hot to grow barley. So this was really relevant information and uh, they liked it a lot. And this story map, this storytelling was a way to offer this boardroom proof um, uh, information. So this was very successful. Now that shows us that uh, uh, co-creation requires multiple cycles of trial and error. So it's not simply a matter of identifying user needs and developing a product. No, you really have to go through cycles and uh, work like from an agile uh, 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 way where you, where you develop different uh, uh, in-between uh, draft versions, discuss it with the end user and uh, go back and forth through multiple cycles of trial and error. And we also learned that um, these generic climate variables are, are not enough. You really have to tailor them into user defined specific indicators. And this again takes time because at the beginning Heineken didn't know uh, what they wanted to know. So it took us quite some trial and error to get at uh, this, this use a defined specific indicator. Now, the final uh, example is about this uh, knowledge portal, this web platform that we developed for the, for the Netherlands. Um, uh, it, so the aim was to really develop a one-stop shop website for the Netherlands um, to support local adaptation efforts. So targeted at city planners, but also private and public parties uh, and also the general public. So quite a wide range of, uh, of end users. In fact, um, there was a coalition um, in which 60 different parties took place. Um, and that coalition was consulted to identify uh, the needs and requirements for this, uh, this portal. And um, what they articulated um, basically comes down to, to a number of points. And, the first thing that they mentioned is that it has to become an inspiring, engaging platform. And they stressed the point that we shouldn't only communicate about risks and vulnerabilities and future uh, issues that, that, that may arise in uh, 20 to 50 years time, but really try to emphasize the positives of adaptation and emphasize the benefits that adaptation can bring to 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 cities. Um, so they said, yeah, it has to be an inspiring, engaging platform. And the second point that we learned uh, in engaging with all these uh, stakeholders was that uh, every situation is different, and every city will approach adaptation in a slightly different way. Um, and we also learned that adaptation is only partly planned. Um, uh, a city and city planning is not like uh, SimCity, where you're the user and you decide what is going to happen. No, it's in a large way a chaotic or fuzzy uh, process. So they uh, asked us to develop a platform which has a modular setup that allows users to go through the information in their own, uh, in their own way. So we decided not to come up with a strict sort of guideline that takes you from uh, uh, and, uh, from the beginning to the end in a fixed order, no, a very modular, um, flexible setup. Um, then they stress the point, it has to be easy to understand and visually attractive, and we need a help desk. So um, that's what we try to uh, achieve. And uh, as a result, we now have a, a web portal um, 
And, and it takes the user past seven steps or ambitions, as they are called. And again, um, it's not in fixed order. So you can start wherever you want. Um, and there's a whole suite of tools uh, on offer that uh, guides you through these steps. But also these tools are not uh, prescribed or fixed. It's just a range of um, uh, tools and services that are out there. Some of them, by the way, offered by uh, consultants on a commercial basis. Some are openly available and uh, available for free. Um, and in that way, the portal is also uh, a shopping window for uh, the consultants in uh, in our uh, in our country. But all very flexible in uh, in uh, in setup. We also um, included a map of good examples, and this map is becoming uh, richer and richer in, in, uh, in examples and, and successful projects that have been uh, implemented. And here you can find some uh, nice examples. Here is the water square in Rotterdam city, for instance, uh, urban greening in Delft, and a multifunctional sea defense in uh, Katwijk. And you can click on all these examples and then it will give information about the project, uh, guide you to some background documents that were used and uh, you can find contact persons at the various, um, uh, at the various organizations. And this um, map of good examples is also a way to show that we are making progress and that uh, um, a whole community is, uh, is developing. So what we learned from this um, uh, initiative is that the framing of climate information is very important. So uh, as climate scientists, we may be used to uh, communicate about risks and vulnerabilities and uh, probabilities and uncertainties, but city planners think in terms of uh, opportunities and solutions and inspirational stories. So this positive framing is very important. And then we learned that adaptation is partly fuzzy or messy and unplanned, and it doesn't follow the traditional unidirectional pathway where you go from risk to solution and you monitor the result. Um, and then lastly, uh, keep it simple and visual because um, often you find that this information is being used by uh, people outside of the climate uh, adaptation community. So often it's about convincing and inspiring others outside of the uh, uh, climate domain uh, to, to uh, start working on adaptation. So the bottom line, I guess, uh, in, in my talk is that we need to take co-creation more seriously. Uh, it's not a stakeholder workshop uh, that you include in work package nine of your uh, project. Uh, it's not just an outreach activity. In fact, it should be the backbone of uh, setting up a service or a web portal. It should be organized at the heart of any uh, initiative or project that you do. Because these user needs, they change over time and they ask for readjustments and flexibility in your uh, project. And for this, you need to reserve substantial time and budget. So uh, co-creation needs to be taken uh, uh, way more seriously. And um, also we need to learn more about uh, what we're doing. And um, there's now a really interesting initiative. And again, Roger Street is in this uh, uh, webinar and he can explain a little bit more about this, uh, I'm sure. But there's a very interesting initiative where we try to step up the knowledge um, about how to set up these knowledge platforms, the lessons learned, um, uh, and, and share those across countries. And um, it's, it's interesting if you read uh, or you look into the literature, there's very little uh, being reported on how to set up a good user interface or how to develop a good uh, climate information website. So there's a there's a, there are lots of gaps there, and um, uh, yeah. So if you're interested, please um, uh, visit the project website, which is on the bottom of this uh, slide. And then finally, uh, if you're interested in some further reading, um, we published our experiences with setting up this uh, this web portal for the Netherlands in a in a paper published in Climatic Change. So again, if you're interested, please uh, please have a look at that, and then. Um, I'll give the word back to Jeanette and I'm open to 
answering some of your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you too, Hasse, for your presentation. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, well, I would like to give, I don't know if there are any questions uh, uh, related to clarifications. I don't really see any, uh, but there's one question specifically to you, Hasse, from Bart and Olivia, Bart van der Herk, uh, I think. Um, knowledge on the local context is indeed very important. Would it, uh, an analog platform at a European scale be feasible, given the difficulty to, to be aware of local context? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And um, yeah, I've always been quite, um, how do you say, uh, 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 critical about the the, the, the possibility to, to sort of close a gap from, say, the national or the global level to the local level. I mean, that's, that's, and I think if you look at also what Copernicus is doing, they are clearly saying we are developing uh, a portal which is not aimed at the societal end users. We are targeting um, uh, intermediary organizations, uh, maybe consultancies, research organizations, and they have to do uh, the tailoring and they have to bridge the, the last mile because yeah the gap is just simply too large and uh, I think this is what Bart is also uh, referring to there's always um, local um, information local context needed when uh, and when you do a local risk assessment you have to know about the adaptive capacity about uh, policies that are in place and that is information you simply don't have at the European or at the global level. So I, I, I would say there's always a need for intermediaries that do the tailoring to the to the local level. Uh, uh, would that then you conclude that it's not possible to have uh, a platform for all types of users? Yeah, what, what I believe in is this this um, storytelling and that you showcase the benefits that the data uh, on offer can have at the local level and that you show and demonstrate how you could tailor this and how you could um, yeah uh, uh, have bridge this last mile i don't think you can go directly there so i believe in you know creating a shopping window offering guidance uh, support and and showcase um, uh, the potential, but going straight uh, to the end users from the global or the, re or the, or the European level is, is uh, a bridge too far, I would say. Yeah, well, I think I, I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But first, uh, Copernicus Climate Change Service said that they would like to be a one stop shop for all users. Yeah. Yeah, it's still very useful, but I don't think uh, indeed that you can reach all users directly. You you need intermediaries, at least as my vision also, to to help use the data. Yeah, yeah, or to tailor it further. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I I'd like to go back to uh, the point about the legacy. Um, and well, you also uh, said something uh, at the end uh, about a project where information or, or experiences of different projects are, uh, are shared among each other. Um, and I think also that, well, the, you have different projects. Uh, Juanjo presented something from a, a project which has financing for a limited time. So it's very difficult to, to maintain and update a website uh afterwards and you presented something about the uh the climate adaptation uh, website which is also meant to to continue con uh, existing and um, um is meant to be updated maybe uh, well maybe roger can also say something about that what he thinks are possibilities to to, to use information from from projects afterwards. 
Yes, uh, I can, and thank you. This is this is a big issue. This is a very big issue because there's a number of research projects that have developed very good programs or platforms or what what interfaces, and then they die. And uh, the information and lessons learned are often not transmitted throughout the community so that we can learn from those. And there, this still is going on. And one of the things that uh, I I got together with a number of other people. We put a special issue out on decision support. This is in climatic change. And that one of the things that we talked about is, is the needing for the recognition that project based platforms are useful only in the fact that they can be. Uh, they meet an immediate need and then they, but it, the real thing is to lessons that generated through through that activity need to be documented and shared. So that future generations and those that are more sustained can can continue, or continue to to reap the benefit of those those, those projects. And it's as you say, there, and and Hasse said, there's very little doc uh, literature on this, and it's much needed. Um, also, when we're looking at funders, um, most of the platforms that we're aware of are are funded as projects. And then when the project dies, then the uh, funding disappears or the project terminates. I should say the funding disappears and then there's a need for funders to recognize that there is that what, you know, there needs to be sustained financial and human resources put into updating these. So it's, it, it is critical, but the, the part where there is projects is, is that as Haas has said, we need to get the literature out there. And get the lessons learned shared so that subsequent platforms and existing platforms can benefit from the results of that research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think about Juanjo? Uh, yeah, indeed, there is a need to sustain the knowledge across time because otherwise, just as has as has said. I think we end up reinventing the wheel uh, every time a new project start when we could be learning from past experiences and so on. In particular, uh, with Predictia, we have also a similar uh, climate uh, scenarios viewer that we have been uh, we have developed uh, since uh, 2014 with the Spanish government. But in that case, the funding is different because they funded the tool in advance, uh, the development, but they have also supported uh, and maintained the portal throughout the time. So that kind of collaboration maybe going or changing from a project based funding to a more uh, tool based funding with uh, when the tool is sustained over time would be a really good thing. But I don't really have an idea on how that could be done on a governmental level or a European level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeanette? Yes. It's Roger here. This is really interesting. And you look at the particular case of, uh, of uh, Prim Primavera and, you know, linking that into the existing Spanish website. Uh, that that on on that is providing information and on adaptation might be an interesting way. And so we need to explore different partnerships is, and Hasa in, in terms has done a little bit of this in terms of the or not done all, some of this uh, with respect to the bringing in uh, partnerships uh, with uh, some of the private or, uh, companies that are providing tools and resources to help help people. So I think this difference we're have to, we are, we'll need to explore these different business models associated with uh, platforms and some of the innovations that we really st we strongly need are in these business models for these platforms so that we can continue to push them forward making sure that the information is there to inform decision making yeah but but then you think that um well what is developed in for example european projects could be reused in for example at the national level for these kind of uh, um well, portals for to, to, to support adaptation. I, I strongly believe that there should be uh, at least a task, if not a work package for all of these projects in Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe 
and a number of other projects that are looking developing where the result is developing the platform. There has to be a work package or a task that starts from the start that looks at what is the legacy. How are we going to move this forward? And if it, you know, and if it works out that it can go to um, Copernicus as a potential tool or a national platform or something else, there needs to be that that should be part of it so that we can. But the other thing, uh, sorry, Janet, I know you're pressed for time. The other thing we have to do is, is that we really need to start looking at the existing literature on on co what is called coex, which is the co-design, co-development, co-production, -co co-evaluation, all these co's. We really need to look at that existing literature. And, and I, I'm glad to see Haas has reflected a lot of that in what they've done. But there, you know, we really need to think about engagement and how we do these this coex that is essential to the success of these platforms. Okay, yeah, I put down also something about reuse of the portals, but uh, well, it would be very good if we could promote this and and, and indeed uh, think of the legacy of these kind of portals from the start of European projects also, and and uh, I think this is also interesting because well for the. Uh, webinar and visualization two weeks ago, I had one question from a lady from, I believe she was from Hungary. She said she was looking for examples of, in this case, especially visualization, but uh, to visualize information for her country. So it, it, there is a need, I think, for reusing the experiences of others and not, as we say, inventing the wheel again. The, Jeanette, uh, one final just point. It's yeah. it's really important that we get this information out through the literature, but also through the community. And because the, the literature, literature often doesn't get to the community. And what we have as a problem is, is that not many of the journals, some only some journals will accept this type of information on coex on on the technical because you know is it research or how do we get it out there but we need to find ways of getting this information so it can be found can be used and can be built upon mm -hmm. yes but, but i think that uh, a journal like climate services would accept these kind of uh, articles i think you're right but, but well, many don't, I, I, I agree. It, it would be nice to have somewhere a website where this information would be collected, where people can look at. And uh, what I also sometimes think of, it would be nice to have a, a, a website where links to examples from other countries, other projects are presented, just to inspire people how, how they could develop something or maybe also to see what they should not do. Okay, I'd like to go to another point. Um, Bart was saying something about the balance between the requirements of the different users. Maybe Bart, you can explain uh, your question or your remark a little bit more, or Olivia, you don't know who. who uh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, this is Bart in Yeah. For some fake reason, reason uh, it has the wrong title. Bart van Eric from uh, .ag indeed. Um, now, both to uh, to the first and the second presenter, I, I, I really appreciate your point that you should put the users' requests for for information uh, central, and, and uh, the user also has, of course, all the contextual elements to offer to you. On the other hand, I, I, I do definitely see a very strong responsibility for uh, the, the developers of these portals and the scientists behind to to take um, yeah to make uh, I would I would actually dare to say that they should make assumptions on on users requests prior to reaching out to these users and I think Hasse made it quite clear with that Heineken example that if you prepare for an elevator pitch maybe that is too too science oriented you of course don't get uh, a positive response but if you go there without anything in your in your back pocket these these board members will look at you and say what 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 is it that you're going to offer to us so so i i, I don't want to dispute the need to put user central but i do want to stress the responsibility of say the scientists and and platform developers to 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 make a, 
picture or your, your a personal picture of that user interest and as if you should continuously ask yourself hey what would i like as information given i would be a user that has the responsibility to make say multi-million decisions on this and this investment or whatever and this is more a philosophical question i don't debate any of the assumptions but i i don't want to put all the burden on the design of these platforms to the users that's not their task and it's not their mandate and it's not their it's not of their concern can, can, I, can i respond to that yes yes well i think um i, I agree with bart um and but i think um the way i see it it's like a two-way street and um so what you and that comes down to co-creation um so so you have to go through multiple cycles of of trial and error and uh, and we as scientists don't uh, directly understand what the users want to know so we have to try something but then the users don't know what they, what they want to know so you have to go up and uh, up and down a couple of times before you reach a proper uh, uh service and that's the point so it's not putting the users up front and letting everything down to them and their decisions. No, it's a joint responsibility and you should co-evolve uh, during the course of a project. And uh, and I think uh, the, what Roger is saying, there's so much to learn about how to organize a good uh, a sort of uh, co-creation uh, process and it's uh, th there's not much being reported about these experiences mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. I think that's the yeah okay yeah. I wanted to add also uh, that we are working with uh, the results also from uh, two European projects that are called uh, the Marco project and the EU Max project that take a deep dive into the user's need of, for climate services and, and so on. And they detail in quite uh, nice detail and very fine detail the user's need for different sectors. So maybe that's an option before organizing a, a co-creation uh, activity to see what the user's needs are in that, uh, in that sector. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yes. Just one quick thing. I agree with what has just been said. I strongly agree. We have done, there There are more user needs studies than I, every time I go out there, I find out more and more and more of them are being done. Exactly. And I, we're not, Are we? what are we learning from those? And I'm not convinced we're learning as much as we should from those, but they're repeated over and over again. Exactly. And we need to really, start to think about how we're doing these co coex co about -eval design evaluation or development production creation evaluation there it's it's a really interesting process and i bet you i could go around everyone here and we would get at least 10 or 12 different variations of what all that means and we have to learn yes yes but well, that is, that is, that is yes. indeed exactly what Haas is pointing at is that this is an iterative approach and that you have to uh, indeed uh, build two way interactions and, and repeat and repeat. But that means that every project you don't start from scratch. You know, every, uh, say, uh, for sure, the seniors in, in all these projects, they have a track record in, in user engagement. So they, they, a project that has a, a, a one year and timeline to actually explore user needs, I think it's a waste of time. You just indeed make assumptions and make use of what has been reported before and start designing from scratch to have something to offer at a much more practical level. That, that is probably more the efficiency of this, this co-creation work has to have some, uh, some appreciation as well. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you, Bart, that um, we shouldn't expect too much from uh, an, an initial user needs assessment because no. what you get out of it is not what they in the end want to know. If they, exactly. These yeah. needs change over time, so you just start somewhere quickly, uh, build prototypes and go through trial and error. And, and, and that's why I made this point. It's, it shouldn't be an outreach activity. And I've seen so many projects where um, they say, okay, let's hire uh, a, a, a party that has good communication skills, because then we can tick the box 
uh, stakeholder involvement and uh, it shouldn't be like that it should be uh, an, an integral part of the project design and setup where you organize these two-way streets uh, and, and go through these multiple cycles. Thank you. M maybe this also refers to one of the things that um, Juanco was saying, that he pointed out that it was very important to have different disciplines working together. What do you think about that? Because that can help the ones with the background information, for example, about mm -hmm. climate data, uh, some well, many people working on on these portals have some experiences with user interaction, but it would be good to have probably also people that have a, a strong background in communication. Um, if I can uh, talk for a minute, yeah. So for Primavera project, uh, I think it was really important to count, for example, with this multidisciplinary team uh, having the support of. Uh, multiple partners that have dedicated uh, user engagement teams because these are teams uh, like for example Erika that it's in the in the audience that have a very different background they come from communication they have uh, economics background they know how to talk with policy makers and as has said before it's also important that we have a big picture in mind and understand uh, how these processes works, for example, in public planning. So the information that we can provide it tailored uh, to those users. Mm -hmm. And Hasse, what do you think about it? I think your team also has different disciplines. Uh... Yeah. yeah, we have, uh, for example, we now have someone on the team that uh, uh, specializes in writing simple language that that everyone can understand, so jargon-free, uh, um, yeah, writing, and, and we have people that specialize in data visualization, um, and then we have people with more governance background. So yeah, we try to to have a mix of people that together can can yeah. Um, and try to 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 offer information in a tailored way, simple to understand, easy to read, easy to to understand. So it's it's uh, I think this bridging this gap is a, almost a discipline on its own. It is yes. not something you can leave to a climate scientist or or to a communication uh, specialist or to an urban planner. Uh, it, it requires multiple disciplines and, uh, and, and yeah, you have to sort of build up experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I, I think I, I see a few remarks on uh, something we discussed before. Um, Erica Palin, who's also working on the Primavera project, says that uh, they are preparing a paper on co-production and um, that they will uh, take into account also uh, what has been successful or not. Uh, so there will be something published on that. And Roger also said that uh, they are working within the within the key A4 CAP projects uh, to start some kind of associate website where, where information is collected on this, where people can learn from, if I interpret it right. Okay, um, one more thing. We have been talking a lot about uh, user interaction for the development of a user interface platforms. Uh, is it also important to have uh, interaction with the users afterwards when the platform is already there? Um, in our case for Primavera, it has been primordial. Like, for example, the first version of the user interface platform uh, was just a first version, a first draft. Uh, it has been remodeled, the, the, the user interface platform. And also, the data viewer that we developed at uh, Predixia was uh, redesigned after getting some user feedback once it was uh, first developed. So I think it's also critical to have this sort of interaction after the project uh, mm -hmm. or the first version of the material is developed. So you can grasp and have an idea on whether the users are finding it useful. And also you can 
steer the wheel towards having a better version of the of the materials. Mm -hmm. Hassan, do you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, not really. Yeah. But you, you just writing something writing. in the chat, so I. <laughs> <laughs> missing out on the, on the discussion a little bit there sorry okay. yeah 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 well, what 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 were you writing no it's just writing that that we were also that we we're also working on a paper on uh, on co-production mm -hmm. actually uh, 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 um, i'm supervising a phd uh, candidate who's going to look at this specific topic for the next uh, three to four years so I'm very interested to to collaborate on this more. Yeah, is this also uh, connected to the project uh, K KE four Cap that you mentioned? Um, loosely connected, I think we uh, maybe Roger can say a few words on this uh, this initiative. Um, we actually we've been trying to set up a European uh, project for quite some years now and every time we fail to get it funded uh, and and I think it's because this topic uh, doesn't really fit anywhere and so it, it it doesn't really fit into say the climate services uh, uh, research it um, yeah so so developing portals and developing interfaces yeah the, the, the sort of in, in in the middle somewhere <laughs> But Roger has been successful in setting up this uh, this 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 initiative. Um, maybe maybe Roger, you can can say a little bit more about uh, the key for cap. I can if if Janet Janet, do you have yes, time? Yes 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 do okay. so. Key for cap, um, as Asa mentioned, is is that a number of us within Europe and and other countries have been exploring this idea of being able to have knowledge exchange, uh, a knowledge exchange activity or forum or network or networks of networks that could really, that would help facilitate the development and the design development evaluation and continual update of these platforms in order that they maintain relevance, usability and uh, and uh, legitimacy within the, the various and credibility within the existing community. So we we've been trying to do this and we've been doing it and we've had partners around the globe, Australia, Japan and Canada, as well as across Europe. It started with something that we did with the uh, under something that was called. Uh, well, let's uh, just say it's something within the uh, in the uh, European Environment Agency. And so we continue to build on this and then KE4 cap is a project that's funded by the European Commission that's trying that is trying to support uh, the um, and enhance the capabilities of countries around the world to contribute to the um, the Kyoto protocol in terms of action action to really push it forward and uh, so what we are doing is, is that we're working with a number of countries to share knowledge and, uh, and lessons learned and, and also work on some of the challenges. And we've created the website uh, workspace that uh, uh, Hassa mentioned there. We've, uh, we've had one, uh, one event, which was in Australia that tried to pull people together. We've had linked events in Japan and Dublin uh, that have tried to pull parts of this community together and sharing knowledge. And we're hope we're now in the process of developing our work program going forward under, we had other events planned, but with COVID-19, uh, we've had to curtail those and are now looking at virtual activities that will allow us to share this knowledge and build this community. And if you look at the countries that we've engaged, we have engaged Australia, Japan, India, South Africa, Argentina, Mexico, and Canada. And if you look at that spread around the globe, what you can see that we have, or have the, build, the building blocks of a network of networks that could really facilitate this development. And uh, so we're trying to push this, continue to push this forward. 
And I should mention that we have an engaged a number of people in Europe as well. So we uh, most at one time uh, we've got about 17 or 18 platforms that are all that engaged with before in Europe. So the idea is to continue this development, continue this knowledge exchange. It's funded until the um, middle of next year. And uh, with this particular funding mechanism and we, the, those of us that have been at the core of it and that we've engaged want to see this continue. And so we're thinking about that as well, a mechanism, a network of networks that can continue moving this forward, which we think is vital. Thank you, Roger. I, I really uh, support this and uh, I, well, I, I, I will take a look at the website of the key for cap and uh, it's really interesting uh, for me. Um, are there any more uh, questions just, at the moment? Jeanette, yes? I should just mention that, uh, that what we've done is, is that uh, we've also, uh, as part of this is uh, climate adapt and Copernicus are part of the network we have in Europe and part of the more not quite core, but the extended community that are planning some of this. I just saw one of the questions from uh, Asa is, is that KE4 cap and, and Copernicus are, are definitely linked, but also climate adapt. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we almost uh, reached uh, half past 11. So that's the end of the uh, of this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants, but especially also the uh, the presenters. Uh, this was really nice, uh, good discussion also, and it also links a lot to what was discussed before uh, in the, the former webinar on visualization. Um, I'd like to end with something that popped up <laughs> when Hasse presented something on uh, the, the case study on beer production. He said, well, uh, it would, uh, we, we don't want the world to run out of beer. And then I remembered something that someone once told me about interaction with users, but that's also important for uh, interaction with colleagues. And uh, that person um, said to me when I asked, well, how we could improve user interaction, he thought a moment and then he said, drink more beer with stakeholders. And uh, well, I hope we can do this face-to-face -face or virtually, but uh, let's continue working on this. Thank you very much. Goodbye.